Thanks, everyone. Like at, the, at the very least, I recommend this thing, this lightning clip mic. It's fantastic for on-the-fly presentations. Uh, how, good evening, everyone. How, how's it all going? All good? Did we have a good 2017? No. No? <laughs> Great, yeah. Best 2017. Cool. Excellent. Well, thanks again for having me uh, back again. I think this is my second presentation at Perth iOS this year. Um, always happy to do them. Always, always having a great time here. Love the free beer. Um, I was going to do a quick uh, spiel on what I'm going to talk about, but Sam pretty much did that for me, so let's just go straight into it. So my name is Tim Oliver, although like Sam just showed, some people like to call me Tom. I have way too much free time at the moment, so I'm spending it um, doing cute little idiotic videos like touching laser swords and stuff like that. Um, that's it. Um, so I've been, I've been um, in, the, in the industry, well not in the industry, but interested in making software for the iPhone since the 3G came out back in all 2008, back when I was an Optus subscriber. Uh, I've been coming to this meetup since 2011, um, and, and just quickly, like I said, I think I said this last time, but hats off again to Sam for running an event for this long. A few meetups actually met their demise this year, one of them being Port 80, which was a very long running one, so it takes a lot to keep a meetup running, um, so let's never forget that. Cheers. Uh, I'm, like I said, I'm currently on holiday. Oh, yeah. I don't Cheers. really do very much. Well, you, you pay the subscription to keep the meetup page going, which is more than some people I know are willing to do. <laughs> um, I'm currently fun employed, which is basically an easy way of saying I'm on the holiday at the moment. I'm having way too much fun, as you can clearly see. Um, and uh, like, um, like, I, like I've said before, like a lot of the time, I, I'm, I'm building my own app, but, but a lot of that app development is uh, writing like UI code for things that like Apple's already done but never made open. So I do a lot of things like crop, crop view controllers and passcode view controllers. Um, and I have a great time with that just because I, lo I love experimenting with um, the UI and how to get like smooth animation. I actually just found out very recently that my crop view controller is being used in two of Sony's apps for the PlayStation, um, which is uh, no pressure. And you know, if it breaks, if, if it breaks, I'm sure they'll come and ask me to fix it. Hopefully, there's some money. Fingers crossed. Not you know, open source is free. Software is free, right? Um, and I, I like I like saying this just because I like I like the uh, the uh, reactions it elicits. I actually said this on Twitter recently, and a, 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 a more seasoned uh, developer I, I, I met in Singapore recently said um, the whole Objective C versus Swift thing is very similar to uh, what how Apple went through the uh, carbon versus cocoa thing a few years back. And he said that just give it time. Eventually, o over the years, Swift will become so amazing that the sheer thought of writing an Objective C is going to be so horrifying that you'll never want to go back. So he said, just wait, your time will come. For the time being, until Swift gets ABI stability, I'm still pretty happy with Objective-C, but that's clearly it's going to change over time. Cool, so just a really quick overview on how, um, <laughs> there's a guy that everyone says looks like me, um, <laughs> uh, of what I'm going to talk about. Um, so let's talk about how I discovered um, the company I worked for, Realm. Um, Basically, how I got the job. Basically, uh, how I found found out about the product, and then the presentation I did at Perth iOS all those years ago. Um, how they then contacted me, and how I somehow ended up working for them for two and a half years, and basically what it was like. So um, just just to keep going, just before I like continue further. So basically, what happened was I, I after the presentation, I basically worked was contacted by them as a user and said like we're we're, we're hiring. Would you like to uh, join us at the moment? And it's been fantastic for the last two and a half years. And basically what happened was just in the end of this year, there was a bit of a corporate restructuring and a lot of the um, remote employees uh, were like, no, we need to consolidate. So um, no hard feelings or anything, but that's the reason why I'm not there anymore. Cool, so I'm sure this is beating a dead horse so much at this point, but I've been working on an app for a little while called iComics, and it's a, it's a DRM-free comic reader. The idea is um, it was one of the uh, few apps on the, on the iPad for comics that weren't a walled garden, so it wasn't like Marvel where you can only buy comics and then read those comics in that app. The idea was, any website out there like um, Humble Bundle and Comixology who give out DRM-free comics, you can just take that and, and just view it. So it's kind of like just a comic version of QuickTime Player, basically. So it's DRM comic, comic reader. Um, because it has to analyze, because the format's basically a glorified zip file with uh, page one.jpg in it, there's a lot of analysis that needs to be done. Things like sorting out which ordering the pages have to be in, because zip files do not store things alphabetically internally, stuff like that. So there was a need to store that kind of information somewhere so I wouldn't have to keep regenerating it every time. Um, there's also other things like user settings, like if it's an Eastern comic, it has to read the other direction, stuff like that. So there's a, a relatively superficial but still necessary need to save data somewhere. So I was, I was designing this thing in 2011, and the state of the databases back then was a little bit different than it is now. The first one was, of course, our favorite NS user defaults, and 
as, we've, as, I've, as I've learned since then, you can store a lot of data in that thing if you try hard enough. Um, really? <laughs> What's your record? How many, how many megs of data? Just, 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 <laughs> just works. It's giant plist files, like just. Mm. Um, so yeah, that one, that one, you know, in a pinch, and, and things like app settings, that's completely um, um, realistic. Sam's favorite, JSON files, um, which work for the, for the most part. Like, if it's, a, if it's just data that's pretty much static, and you just need to page it into memory, and then page it back out again, like it's snapshots, I mean, that's completely realistic. And the great thing about that is it means there's no dependencies as well. Like, back in 2011, that was when NSJSON serialization just came out in, in the shiny new iOS 5, so that was the hottest shit back then. Um, Serializing everything to JSON. I mean, you can use plist as well if you want, but JSON was where it's at. And now that we've got the decodable protocol in Swift 4, like I'm sure uh, using JSON as a database is only going to get more and more common. Um, SQLite is also a really good one. I was, before iComics, I was making a Pokemon themed app that used SQLite as a backing, and that one was really good. The problem with SQLite, though, is it's not really an object uh, sort of database. So you have, to, you have to do all this manual mapping code yourself to take, to do a query pull the data out and then map that to an object you can then pass around and pass to things like table views. So it's good, but a lot of code. And then the last one, which is totally not Sam's favorite, right? Whose favorite is it? I'm some guy at Apple's, I think. Um, it's core data. So core data is basically Apple's solution to trying to make SQLite a little less code heavy. So they, they provide, it's basically a framework that comes in every iPhone where you can basically provide the schema and then Apple would, will help you generate the model objects and then perform most of the code necessary to like map the results of SQLite to uh, your objects. But it's not just SQLite, like the whole point of core data is it's very abstract. So you can even change, like swap out SQLite and back it with XML. So it's like this giant framework to do everything, every single thing that's about data. Um, but as you can guess, there's a few inherent problems with that. So we, um, we had a huge chuckle at Realm, uh, was it last year or the year before, when, when App, uh, Apple did a talk about core data, and that was their uh, slide for uh, core data, their, their, their like, title card for the thing. Um, the thing is, core data sounds really good on paper. Like, it's basically, um, Apple was like, yes, SQLite's really good, because SQLite's the default, is a really good sort of um, database. Um, but the problem is, it's just not really there for objects. So the idea for core data was to just map it to, um, to basically turn it from like a non-object-based sort of framework into an object-based one. Um, but because it's so huge, because it's so complicated, because you don't have to use SQLite, because you can swap out SQLite and use plists or JSON or XML if you want, it has a very huge learning curve. It's also got other features like undo history. So if you want to have like an undo state in your app, you can do that. But the problem is because all these features are there, it becomes so amazingly complex and to learn how to actually work it takes a lot of time. And the problem I was having was, um, the second you try to do anything with threads, for example, we've got a really long lasting operation on the background, like in my case, I was importing a comic, and then you're doing a write to the database in the background thread, getting the main thread to then acknowledge that write happened takes a lot of finagling. Uh, sometimes it works, and sometimes you get the object, but then there's no data in the object. So it's not a nil object per se, but it's still like an object where everything is nil inside it. And it's just like, what, it's like just, is this my fault? Is this core data's fault? Or whose fault is it? Um, as a result, um, because of the complexity, like because you, you can swap out the underlying engine, there's like a lot of boilerplate code you have to write before it actually works. Things like the NS persistent store coordinator, setting up contexts, and then like do you save the context or do you like regenerate the context every time you need to, uh, access to the database? Um, and as a result, there was a library called Magical Record that came out that made it like uh, basically took care of all that for you, which made Core Data a lot nicer. But basically, I put up with Core Data for like a good two years in um, iComics, but basically there was this moment that came where the, the straw, a straw broke the camel's back and I was like, that's it, I, I, I'm done, I can't do this anymore. So basically what happened was, I just finished making this amazingly lovely looking UI for iOS 6 and then iOS 7 happened and I had to tear that all out again because suddenly gradients were uncool and shadows were horrible. Uh, so I spent like a whole year re redoing the app um, but I also added a whole new pile of features like collections. So that what that meant was the schema that was uh, already in there needed to be changed. And now Core Data can do migrations. Problem is, a successful migration is a very relative thing. Um, so I was in my tunnel vision just saying, I need to ship this, I need to ship this, it's fine. So I was, I was constantly deleting the app and then reinstalling it from scratch and doing I was like, this is working fine. And then I, I finally put it out to test flight and people were like, I just tried installing it over the the copy that was on the App Store already, 
and everything broke. Like the database got corrupted. Like nothing would render. Like the whole, and the problem was the app could not cope with that much data corruption. Because it wasn't like checking for stuff is nil. There was stuff there. It was just completely like unreadable and, and things like that. So basically what, what was happening was a migration was failing, but there was no output to the console, no way to debug it, no way to find out what was going wrong. And um, yeah, that was a bit shit. Uh, so the lesson here, really importantly, I think was uh, beta testing is good. Um, it, I, I was in my own little world, and I probably should have thought that I should, you should test installing your own app over an, a previous version, but I wasn't. So, so, so thankfully, a bunch of users had done that. So um, I definitely recommend never assume that you on your own can like test every code path, because the second you give it to someone else, they'll find a code path you've clearly missed. Um, as a result, uh, test flight is amazing. It's gotten a lot better over the, over the, over the years. Um, it's like now the review time is like less than a day, and you can you can t was it ten thousand yeah. people now? Yeah, you can have, yeah you can invite ten thousand people, which is a, a a lot more than the hundred device limit that used to be when TestFlight wasn't owned by Apple. Oh, <laughs> yeah, true. That's that too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm sure Apple's totally happy using it as an unofficial distribution mechanism. <laughs> I see. Yeah, yeah, it's like three months, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah, basically. Uh, I had to go find a new database. And it was actually, actually this time, I think it was actually you, Sam, you said like, this thing called Realm just came out, you should give it a try. I was like, okay. Um, they had a cool looking website, and as yep. we all know, a cool website is the number one criteria. Was it, about I've got a screenshot of the website. It, well, it was very, very cool back then. It was very dark. So, um, yeah, basically I came to the conclusion that core data is obviously terrible. I even emailed Apple and said like, can I have some help? And they're like, send us a sample app that reproduces the thing. I was like, I can't reproduce, it just happens. So. I was like, okay, no, Apple, Apple can't help me. So I was actually at one point going like, okay, SQLite might be the way to go. Like, it's going to be a lot of code, but at the very least I have full control. So if, if, if something crashes or a migration goes wrong, it's my fault, not some Apple internal framework that's faulting me. Um, so I was very much considering SQLite. And then I also consulted Sam, and Sam recommended JSON. And I was like, JSON actually might work as well, because you could... It, the main problem with JSON was... Um, you can't do queries on it, but I was thinking you could just break it up into separate JSON files and just pull in the files you need, and it would actually be pretty, pretty straightforward. So JSON was a realistic alternative, um, but surely there must be a better way. So at that time, I think Sam found the Realm website. I played with it before I... That's what it looked like. Yeah, I've had, I, this is from my 2014 presentation, by the way. So I went back, I was like, oh, wow, that's... Like, the Focus and GitHub thing went away so quickly after that. Um, like, oh, so... And, like, this is pre-Swift as well. Like, like, they, they launched the Objective-C version just as Apple announced Swift, and so they're like, well, I guess we're making a Swift version now. Um, yeah, so, the basic story was, I played with it earlier and went, that looks nice, but I haven't got the time to swap my whole infrastructure over to another database, but suddenly I found myself a ton of time to swap over to a new uh, database. So I remember saying out loud at that point, oh, what the hell, there's no way this thing can be possibly as bad as core data. So, um, <laughs> just famous last words. Um, so, basically, it was one evening. In fact, I remember we went to a .NET meetup. I was working on iComics at a .NET meetup in the Bank West building. I remember that one. Um, and I was basically going, oh, okay, how do, I com how do I convert an entire infrastructure over to a, uh, another database? Turns out it was very easy. Just have to rename NS Manager object to RLM object, uh, change NS number to NS integer, which is awesome, because Core Data only let, had, let you work with NS numbers. So you had to like convert any numbers going into it into NS number and then extract like the float value or the int value back out. So that was amazing. Um, every bit of code that involved querying and writing just rename, just changed it to the API. And then I think this took about three hours and I hit build and try for the, hope for the best. Just like fingers crossed, like, scare, like staring away, like, oh God, it's gonna blow up. Um, but the crazy thing was it just worked, like out of the box. Like, all the crashes went away, the data was still there, it was stable, writes would happen in the background thread and appear on the main thread instantly. I was like, what? Much like that. Um, but, okay, this is a kind of a, kind of a, a, a long deviation, but hopefully this is kind of looped around. But the important thing here is um, side projects are good. Like, I could not have done that in the production app I was building for at a, at a company or something like that. There's no way a company would let you take the risk of like, well, this current database is, broken, let's move to another one. They, they probably, like, it, realistically, I would have been required to go through and work out why the migration was failing. Um, and that probably would have been very, very agonizing. So what I liked, like about side projects, and again, this is with my, my open source libraries as well, like they let you just basically play with things, and as a result, you learn new things, you can actually uh, find out easier ways to do things. Um, 
and since there's no time limit and there's no budget, well, yeah, no budget, um, this is really good because it lets you learn and it also lets you find out about new technologies and everything about it's good. Um, when I was in Italy two years ago at an iOS uh, conference, I met a really cool guy called Michael Flarup and he said he wanted to do a presentation one day about just how good side projects are because um, they, they are like the best way to show off your skills, to show off your passion, to show off how, how good you are of actually keeping to a release schedule, things like that. So they're, they're like a really good way of showing your employability. Um, granted, you could also spend every night you know, playing with your kids or playing video games, so it is a bit of a sacrifice. Anyway, so um, I was amazed at how good Realm was, so I, I, was, I was working next to Sam at the time, so I was like, Sam, can I do a presentation at, at Perth iOS about um, Realm? And he was like, sure, okay. So I got, we, this is back when um, Perth iOS was at the, um, what's it called, Sync, Sync, Sync Labs. Yeah, Sync Labs in Leaderville, which is it's still there, right? I haven't been there in so long. It's not red anymore. You can see how excited Matt looks about Realm. Um, yeah, so basically it was November 20, 2014, which was my birthday back then. So this, is, this is literally like last month was like three years on the mark. Um, I basically drank uh, six or seven beers and then just sat down and were like, check this, guy, check this out, guys. So I basically said the exact, thing I've just, the exact same thing I just said now and then like just sat down for like a good hour and just like showed how the guy works. Um, and as a, basically by sheer coincidence, I wasn't planning on recording it at all, but um, a, a friend, Brendan Reagan, who is, again isn't here today because he's off at another um, Christmas party at the moment, um, said, I can't come, please record it. So you can't really see it, but I'm wearing a, a I bought back then, it was a, ro a really expensive like Rode headset mic attached to like a recording box in my pocket. I've, I've streamlined it since then. Um, and basically recorded that and did a screen recording. And then um, basically what I did was like once I got home, it was a matter of like taking the screen, screen recording, taking the, the raw web from my, the box in my pocket, because it wasn't even my iPhone, and um, stuck it together and uploaded it to YouTube. And I made this one tweet. I didn't even at the Realm account. I just said, I did to talk about Realm. CC, Brendan, here's the presentation. And somehow Realm were just looking for the word Realm on Twitter, which you'd be amazed is like a really common word, so they must get a lot of random tweets. Um, and they're like, well, that's great. Could you send us an email about it and uh, let us know what you think about it? Um, we'd be interested to talk to you more about it. It's like, okay, cool. So I sent them an email. So they're like, hey, this is basically the, the I did a video tonight. And I talked about all my problems and how I was like, basically, I, I went ahead and ported it to, um, ported from Core Data to Realm in like one evening, which they, they loved hearing because it was like, wow, a user can like actually vouch that this is a very easy process to move to. Um, so the next step was uh, like, thanks for that. Here's a, here's a sweet card saying like, happy birthday. And uh, here's a, the, the VP of product and the head of marketing at the time um, with like hats on and some Realm stickers, which I should have brought. I'll bring the Realm stickers next time. Because um, they're, they're really old school now. Like the, the, the logo's changed since then. And it was basically really cool. And we just kept in touch over and over. Um, and I'll talk about it a little more in a sec. The lesson here, clearly, is that uh, for better or for worse, YouTube is a good thing. Um, basically because uh, people can find your videos. Um, and again, and on, uh, conversely, Twitter is also a good thing because like, I didn't even think to mention to Realm about it, but I, I basically just said on Twitter, I made a video about Realm and it was, like, the video was public. Um, and that was the end of that. Um, another important thing to, to realize is um, that's not the, my, that, that video is not my most popular video. My most popular video is one of my friends eating a hot chili and then nearly dying <laughs> on camera. That one has the most views. Because um, it's hilarious to watch. He also like drank all of my milk in the video. Um, but basically, this is the, the thing. Um, people are always watching on Twitter. It doesn't really matter how big or small the follower count is. All it takes is one interested person to see the tweet or see the video, and clearly everything can change. So basically, what I'm trying to say here is, um, recording videos is a very good thing. We should be doing more of that. We should be publish publishing as much of the content as we can. You totally on it? Okay, cool. I have to like, if you want, I might just leave this, this microphone here. You can borrow it for the rest of the things. Um, so basically what happened was after, after that initial email, um, they sent me some sweet swag. So they sent me a box of shirts, which I handed out another Perth iOS meetup, um, as well as that, that, those stickers. Um, the VP of product, like we had a Skype interview, and basically it was like, let's, let's have a quick chat so I can talk about what went into doing the migration. And like it became an article on the website that was there for like a good year and a half or so. Excuse me. Um, another thing then, which became a bit more serious, was um, the VP was like, could, you, could we like just send some investors your way who are thinking about giving us money, and as a user, can you tell them how awesome the product is? I was like, yeah, I guess I could do that. So, like, 
in SF time that was like, wake up at five in the morning, jump on Skype and be like, yes, I'm half asleep, but it's a good thing, a um, couple times. And then they, they then, then said like, we are actually uh, hiring at the moment, so if you want, and I, at the time I was like, this can't be right. This is some random people I found on the internet. Like 10 years ago, my parents would say, don't talk to strangers, let alone go work for them. But um, basically I was like, okay, well, I, you know, into, into applying is not, not, not a bad thing. So yeah, like, I was basically like, well, applying to a company on the internet seems legit. Oh, well, sure, let's give it a try. So. Um, the recruitment process is pretty straightforward. Like, I've interviewed at a few other companies since then. Um, I'll tell you the names of them afterwards, just they're not in the video, but they were a lot really big companies. Um, and for pretty much all of them, it was basically the exact same process. Actually, I'll, I'll say one, because I interviewed, I interviewed with Uber at the exact same time as Realm. So I was basically doing interviews of Uber as well as Realm. Thankfully, I got the Realm job before the Uber job, otherwise this might have had a very different ending. Um, so first things first, I talked to the, the, the head of the iOS team. Um, and that was really interesting because he, like, I was curious as to how technical this company was. I had, didn't have an idea, but this guy was really switched on. Um, and he said some really interesting things that made me think. Like, he was saying, like, are there times we wouldn't want to use Arc? And I'm like, why wouldn't you want to use Arc? Arc's amazing. And he's like, no, actually, Arc can, sometimes the compiler can't, you know, insert, retain, and release automatically as good as a, a human still can. So in cases where you want absolute granular control and, and speed of, and efficiency, like build times as well as, like, proper granular memory control, even to this day, there are times when not using Arc is a, um, a good thing. Even you, can't, you can't not use Arc and Swift, right? Yes, yeah, so that's, that's probably more, more of a moot point now because now you can't not use Arc and Swift, so yeah. After that, it was a coding test. It was a very straightforward test. You'd expect of a database. It was basically create a, what was it? Create a, create a, a thread safe cache where you would be putting objects in and then the oldest object would get flushed after a certain limit. So. Very straightforward, and at two other companies I've interviewed, I had similar questions. Um, if you do get that question, the answer is you use a dispatch barrier, in, in case you're wondering. So that, that, that means basically, if you're reading from a, an object, like an NS dictionary on a separate thread, you can use a, a dispatch barrier, which means that it'll queue up writing to that um, object while other threads are still reading from it. So there's actually a proper way. I, I totally read a, a Ray Wendelick tutorial how to learn how to do that. Um, as all iOS developers do. Um, but yeah, that's like a really textbook uh, interview question, apparently. So dispatch barrier, remember that. Um, then after that, I had an interview with the VP of engineering. So that was like the, the higher up person who managed all the teams, just talked about like my own experiences, what I want to get out of the company. And I, I was pretty upfront. I was like, I'm, I've got a pretty sweet job at the moment, and this seems like a huge gamble. And he was like, no, no, trust me, we're a real company and, and everything. And I was like, I was like, okay, okay, sure. And then, then we had like a contract negotiation at the end, and I was like, Oh wait, then I had one more with the VP of product, but I already talked to him a lot. And then I was like, okay, uh, I'd like this much, please. And they're like, yep, done. I was like, wait, is that, was that too low then? <laughs> Shit, what? So, <laughs> oh, okay. And yeah, so I was like, okay, cool. All right, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's go forward to this and see if it's actually realistic. So the next thing is they, send, they sent over a contract in PDF, and I was like, uh, it looks all right to me, but I sent it to my, thankfully my sister actually does law, and she looked at it, she was like, this is pretty standard for America, but there are a few like crazily overbearing sort of clauses to it, things like anti-compete and things that like don't actually make sense to Australian labor laws. So I was like, all right, send the contract back with like annotations like get change this, get rid of this, please change this. So it took two or three revisions. Um, but basically, well, it was lawyer, was my sister. Um, but the, the crux of that was you probably shouldn't just sign anything you get from overseas because it's obviously made for a different uh, um, country and different laws apply. Uh, but the, yeah, the story takeaway there is like make sure you always you know get someone who knows what they're doing about law to actually look at contracts you get overseas. Um, and yeah, in any case, I was like, all right, this is a, this is a huge gamble. I, I might get screwed, but let's try it. I, I signed the contract, quit my previous company, and we um, went forward with that. So right after that, I um, was invited over to San Francisco. The company was in San Francisco, um, and to uh, just to participate in one of their uh, first conferences, like conferences, like meetups for everyone from around the world and the, both the SF office and the Copenhagen office um, came together. So I took an Uber to the address on the, on, the, um, on the website and it was like just this complete nondescript door with like realm like duct taped to it. And I'm like, is this how I die? Um, <laughs> we go inside and like just inside the door is this giant staircase that goes up. And inside is like, this giant nondescript hallway 
of like these rooms that don't even have like walls that go to the ceiling. Um, it looks a bit better now because they actually painted the door. The door in the very distance is the realm door. Um, and then I actually got in there. I was like, oh wow, this is actually, an, actually a fully like decked out company. Like they actually spent a lot of time. Uh, just to cut the story, sto the, the story short, this building used to be a car park. So you know, SF is like Startup Central. They turned a, car, a parking building into a startup building. So all those um, offices down there are actually separate companies. And Realm got the, 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 one, the room at the very end. They actually sealed it off properly and um, put in carpet and put in like nice flooring. It's actually a really, you can still like, as you're walking, feel the grooves where the cars used to drive, um, but it's still a really, really nice um, environment. And just a, a hilarious story. Um, basically, at the end of last year when I went back there, there's like a, an, a lift for like a giant like industrial lift there. But the problem was it was open to an open door, so pigeons were getting in. So I walked down the hallway once, it's like there's pigeons flying everywhere. And I'm like, what? what? And so like, I was really glad that we had like a sealed off area because um, everyone else there got like pigeon crap all over their desks, which is like the one thing you never want to come in on a on Monday to find. Uh, so yeah, pigeon crap is bad. So San Francisco is an amazing place, by the way. Um, even with the current political climate, it's a very, very, sorry? In and Out Burger, yeah, that's a, the most important bit there. Is a, is a very, very famous franchise chain called In and Out Burger. It still has like they like they intentionally keep like the 1950s vibes, which is really, really cool. And um, they have like a, a menu in, inside, but they have a proper menu on their website. So you know, if you're in the know to what you want to order, the menu is actually huge. Um, back then, the biggest Apple store was that one there, um, but they've actually completely shut that one down. Last time I was there, they. <laughs> they'd gutted it and co covered up the Apple logo of giant big black bits of cardboard because they'd moved up the street now to a much nicer looking one. Um, but yeah, this, this is all photographs from two years ago. Um, but yeah, it was just fantastic going to Fra San Francisco. Um, it was really good to, to go there. And like, there's a lot of stuff to go to do there. So even if you're not in tech, like it's a great holiday destination. So the point of going over there was to think what we called Realm Stravaganza. So this is where the, the CEO got up, introduced himself and talked about the origins of the company. It's basically a week long of um, doing meetings about uh, upcoming features for the, for the thing. We hadn't announced at the time, but the plan then was to start working on a synchronization engine. Um, so you could actually just like do a write. It ended up being called the Realm Mobile Platform. The idea was you could do a write on one device and have it's, like the deltas just update other devices. So that was in development for a very long time. And then on the weekend we went surfing at like five in the goddamn morning and I got like destroyed by waves constantly and I'm never trying that again. Like I, that was actually very painful. And then finally we had like professional mug shots taken, which uh, I still have mine to get around somewhere. And then um, right after that, because the, because the, main, the main office is SF, but they have another office in Copenhagen. There was a, a second realm strapping answer later on in the year. So we went to Copenhagen as well, which is a beautiful place. Absolutely recommend it if you want to go see like some really nice European architecture. Um, and again, so this happened in like, September of that year. And we did things like, I, I actually made that, that demo with the puzzle. So the idea was showing off like how the synchronization engine works. Two people could have two devices and contribute to the same puzzle. So one could be dragging one piece around, one could be dragging the other piece around. And then um, I, that, and there, like, I made sure there was nothing like private there, but that's all public. Like, that was our plans for like, all the data conversion engines we were going to write at some point, including like, con like a SQLite to Realm, like JSON to Realm, stuff like that. I actually do want to ride a JSON to Realm one myself at some point. And then at the last one, we took a ferry ride around the bay, which is like past all these European military ships and submarines and like old school ships. It was really, really cool. Um, that was, yes, yeah, so that was basically when we traveled, when, like, when we were invited out to Realm events. But apart from that, it, um, it was, I, was I, I got the job, but I was stationed here in Perth. Um, so I was working remotely. Um, that's the photo I took in my last day of working at the company. Um, so, I worked out Space Cubed, uh, which is why I knew the, the, the spiel that Sam was saying just then. Um, <laughs> they say it a lot. Um, Space Cubed's a really good place to work at, um, not just for the lovely environment and the sweet, fast internet, but like there's an internal, f it's not Facebook, it's called, uh, what's it called, Yammer? Yeah. Yammer. There's a network called Yammer where everyone in Space Cubed like, contributes, and there's a lot of people who come here, like lawyers, patent lawyers, and, and people who, who know how to like, help start up companies. So, um, like I said before, even if you don't work here full time, there's like a $25 per month community, um, which gives you access to the Yammer and everything. So it's really, really valuable. But basically I came here and just advertised Realm on Yammer and did my own thing. And if people had any questions about iOS development, I'd, I'd pitch in every now and then. My basic day was I come in, I usually came in pretty late because Realm meetings would go on to like two in the morning sometime. But I come in at like 11 and work till like six or seven and then have more meetings in the evening. Usually my 
my routine I got into was I do like support in the morning because basically America and Copenhagen would go to bed, people would be using Realm and ha get stuck or report bugs or like break something, like corrupt the database and start panicking. And basically the morning was like doing as many of those tickets as I could and the afternoon was spent like doing things like working on the browser or making new um, um, data. Uh, I was doing data conversion um, frameworks for a bit and then in the end I was doing some demo apps as well. Um, so I'd have a weekly team meeting with the Coco team at 11 p.m. every Tuesday and when daylight savings turned on in America, it'd be every 12 a.m. Wednesday, uh, which is always, always really, a really nice like, quiet time to do meetings. Um, and then I would, basically I'd, every, every month I'd have a one-on-one -on -one with, um, with like the VP of product to, hear, to, like, to talk about like how they thought I was going and like if I had any questions and things like that. And then every month we'd have a hands-on, which is basically um, an all-hands where the CEO would just jump on and talk about the state of the company, plans coming up and stuff like that. So how do you exactly do you work for a company remotely? Basically it's a bunch of websites, um, mainly these ones, these are the main ones. Um, hopefully you've all heard of these ones. Never seen Slack before. I, I'm actually, someone made a great joke. They're like, they're like, now the 18 core iMac Pro is out, I can finally run Slack and another Electron app at the same time. <laughs> Uh, so Slack is, again, I think everyone knows what Slack is, um, a really good, like, basically the modern age IRC, I guess. So how, how Realm worked with Slack is there was like a general channel that was only reserved for when, like a company-wide announcement, so everyone was dialed into that one, and you got yelled at if uh, you said anything that wasn't pertinent to the whole company. Um, things like when new people were hired and stuff like that. There were, there was a status channel. The idea was to try and keep track of what everyone was up to. So if, if someone was spinning their wheels and was stuck or something like that, it was a status channel where every week you're just like, I'm working on this, I finished this this week, and next week I plan to do this. Um, there were dedicated channels for each team. So I, I hung out in the Cocoa channel for the most part. But there was also a Java uh, channel for the, the Android version of Realm and a core one for the folks in Copenhagen working on the C++ engine. Uh, there was an ops one for if you needed like, if you needed, like a license for like Photoshop or Sketch or um, After Effects and stuff like that because uh, there was video production as well. Um, ops would handle that sort of thing. Um, and then another thing which I think is kind of unique is whenever a new feature is coming up and it required like, a lot of discussion, like design and like coordination, uh, people would make like a feature dash whatever channel and then like invite all the interested parties in and say like, all right, this is what we need to do. Copenhagen has to do this, SF has to do this and like coordinate. Um, but that being said, like there, we had like a lot of meetings over the years saying like uh, Slack is a very tricky mechanism because I'd go to bed at like one or two and I'd wake up at like 10 or something, and uh, basically there'd be tons and tons of chat messages to go through every single day. So it's like actually getting up to date of what happened was um, a challenge in itself. But then the other challenge was because we've got these remote people who aren't privy to the conversations that happen in the office, a lot of stuff would get said in the office and then would never make it to Slacks. And then it's like, oh, you missed that conversation. Oh, okay. So um, I, don't know, I don't know if Realm ever really properly tried to fix, well, they'd, there was efforts to fix it, but uh, basically it became a bit of a challenge, especially as the company grew and grew. So um, I guess if you are also using Slack at your own company, it's something that to be aware of. It's like, it's very tricky to make sure, like maybe you should have like a, a permanent status channel for St. Lane's, like this is the stuff that got discussed and this is what the decisions from that were. Uh, GitHub. Um, uh, I, I still like Dropbox as my source control, but GitHub's good too. Um, so for the, for the company, like all the code was stored in GitHub, which I, I thought was amazing. Like I've been in other companies where they had like separate like Bitbucket and separate separate repos, but no, Realm consolidated everything into one repo, into one organization. And then I, I being the rebel, made a separate a separate one called Realm Demos for the demo apps because I didn't want the demo apps to start like getting in the way of the main product. Um, there was one specific repo internally called Realm, uh, Realm Wiki, where you could, where everyone like things like company policy, onboarding, um, every every week, like those Coco meetings, there'd be minutes, and those minutes would be recorded in the wiki, and even just things like how the how the how the database is architected were um, all like done in one wiki in GitHub, which I thought was quite interesting. Like I've known other places do that, they're on like Wikipedia, Fork, PHP thing as well, but like GitHub is a fantastic wiki engine, so you can just stick everything in there, and it works really well. You can embed images, so you can like, it's, it's, it's good, you can just drag and drop a JPEG into the text box and, and like GitHub will upload it to Amazon S3 and everything automatically, so uh, for images it's fantastic. Um, every, every thing, so the marketing team used another one called Asana, 
but for the, engineer, the engineers, like everything was tracked in GitHub issues. So things like new features, bugs, and in the open source ones, like even other users, like external users could actually report bugs and they'd be logged as like, yep, we'll get on that or no, we won't do that. Um, but it was fantastic to see that everything was just funneled through GitHub issues. Um, I didn't do a separate slide for Waffle, but basically Waffle probably isn't even necessary anymore. Like Waffle, Waffle was like a GitHub, it was like a separate service some folks made to turn GitHub into Trello. So basically you'd have separate columns, you could categorize your issues and then drag the issues across. Like in progress, done, won't fix. You could actually visualize the progress of issues. But since then, I think GitHub actually did their own. There's not like GitHub projects, so their own, yeah. Yeah, so now, now GitHub have got that fu functionality integrated right into GitHub. So Waffle might be screwed. Hopefully not, because they're a really good service. But um, yeah, so you can now actually just manage your own projects inside GitHub. Um, PRs, it was very, very fast. Like I, I hadn't really done much um, remote uh, code uh, sub uh, submission before. So it was very fascinating to see how PRs were handled. Because it was basically, here's an issue. You have to, do, you have to get it, like create the issue, upload, upload the PR. And then Realm had, it wasn't Travis or anything, it was like an internal cluster of Mac Pros running Jenkins, and that was integrated with um, GitHub. So when you did a push, it would then run the unit tests on those Mac Pros, re report success or fail, and it was very thoroughly tested. Like even if you did something that would just make the, the, a database transaction slightly slower, that would be treated as a regression. So it had like everything including profiling as well as testing. And then once that was green, then another engineer or two engineers would go in and actually review code and be like, I got so much crap, like, you know, you didn't put an extra blank line at the end of this, at the end of this file, or um, you should put this bracket on this line instead, and stuff like that. Like, like not only just like code quality, like not just code efficiency, but also like code quality. So it was a very high standard, which is a, I guess when you start writing tons and tons of code, that's a very important thing. And then, like I said, it's basically, um, I don't know, has anyone tried Jenkins? Yeah, people. Do you like Jenkins? Okay, cool. Yeah, I've heard like um, the, the the folks who run Jenkins at Realm really love Jenkins, but I've heard a few other people say like it's it it can fa it's a Java back thing, so it can fail kind of randomly and like sometimes it will fall over. Um, so there's a lot of mixed opinion on Jenkins, but I, I've never tried it. I was going to try um, for my own one. It's free. Oh yeah, it's also free. True, that's a very good point. Um, one I was going to try it's called Build Kite as well, but there's lots of testing things out there. In fact. If you want, Buddy Build is actually really good one these days, and Tra Travis has a free version for open source and a paid version for private projects. Um, so yeah, like te testing is really, really important to code, and it's, it's so free these days, you don't have to really, you, there's no reason why you shouldn't be doing it. Um, so Help Scout was a cool thing I didn't know about until I actually joined Realm. Has anyone heard of Help Scout before? Cool, one, excellent. Um, was that another one? Or? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, so HelpScout is like HelpScout.net. It's a website for managing support tickets. So um, Realm had a pile of email addresses like info at Realm, help at Realm, admin at Realm, stuff like that. All those top, like not, you know, not belonging to one person would get funneled into HelpScout. So it's like this, this one shared inbox. Um, so if a person sent an email at help at Realm, like I need help with my, data, my, my app using Realm, we could reply to that really quickly. Like I just said, it, it, it aggregates the email addresses and then stores it in one bucket. Another cool thing which I really liked was you could also set it to say like, okay, look, keep an eye out on Stack Overflow and if there's any threads that get created with the tag realm, like bring those in as well. So they, they get like brought in with the, um, the emails. So this way we could tell like straight away if someone posted on Stack Overflow, I'm stuck with realm and I need some help, we could get like pinged about that really straight away. And then, that was the big one. And then later on, we actually introduced a, a forum. So it was like forums.realm.io where you could actually ask questions about Realm there as well. And that would also get funneled into this. The great thing about this is um, Realm, the, the Realm, Realm, Realm people themselves could either assign tickets to themselves or um, assign tickets to other people. Like this, this like someone would be like, this is a, a Copenhagen problem. The Copenhagen folks can like handle this one and stuff like that. And in fact, it did get to the point where we were having, we were getting so overrun with support at one point, we actually just came up with a system called the support czar where basically one person each week would be in charge of like just reviewing the list of issues each morning and not replying to them because that would take all day, but like divvying them up to each person. So like, okay, you can do that one, you can do that one. Um, and yeah, basically um, that was a really efficient way of like just basically spre spreading the love, the support love to make sure not one per poor person, like wh whoever woke up first gets to do all the support tickets. Cool. Um, and so the most of this year, it's gonna work. We did this thing called the Realm World Tour. The idea was um, now that the synchronization engine at this point had been made public and 
Um, the idea was to start showing it around to companies who'd like to start thinking about using it, or even just to, to answer questions about the, the, the normal database as well. Um, basically, uh, pretty much, well, the, for the first half of the year, it was just Northern Hemisphere, because I was in America too at that time. Um, people, like two engineers would fly to some place, set up the banner, bring out some free food, do a presentation about how the technology works and show some demo code, a lot of live coding, which is always up and down. Um, <laughs> I had, one, I had one where I was like, this demo is fine. I tested it in the hotel room. Just got on stage and the whole thing just shat itself. I'm like, well, this is what is supposed to happen. But yeah, um, <laughs> it didn't happen. Um, but thankfully, like, after some more practice, it, the thing of life coding is just, it's just practice. Just, yeah, after that, it got pretty easy. But yeah, um, I did, I'm trying to think how many places I went to. So I went to, um, my, my colleague spoke at the SF one, but I was the MC for that one. So I was like, I was like, Oh, and that was a fascinating one. Like, let, me, let me tell you a story about that one. So the, the, the kickoff was we did a world, a world tour at the, at the San Francisco office. It was a fantastic presentation, a whole turnout of people. Um, but this is a terrifying story. One person rocked up, and she had some e-cigarette batteries in her purse. And right in the middle of the, the talk, one just ignited, it exploded in, <laughs> in her bag, yeah. So you know, we just hear like this bang, a scream, smoke everywhere. Um, lithium fires are not to be screwed around with, like it was on the ground, on fire, spinning around. One of the other realm guys tried to step on it, but like, it, just, it's like, it was so hot it just went straight through his rubber soles. Uh, so don't step on a lithium fire. Um, but yeah, and like it just burnt a hole in the carpet, but it, it fizzled out in the end. Um, she was okay. She had, like, she, had like, she, had like, she had like a burn like here on her leg, like it just went straight through her clothing. Like, it went straight through the bottom of the purse, onto her leg before she had time to like throw it off. Um, and yeah, so that was a bit more fun than we expected. Um, but I guess at the same time, just we should, we should count our blessings that no one got hurt and it didn't happen on the bus ride home because that would have been a lot worse. But this was, it was scary because like, there was no indication. It wasn't plugged in. It wasn't on. It was just a battery in her bag and it just ignited. So um, yeah, lithium batteries, we all have one in our leg. Like, I have like 10 on, me, on my person right now. So uh, well, not that many. Yeah, that was a bit of interesting. But after that, we did like an operational safety and health course, like CPR and stuff. Um, so that was really cool. So like, yeah, yeah basically, um, we realized like we, we were kind of prepared, but at the same time, like you're running an event, anything can happen. And that was like a good wake up call. Like anything can happen. So um, yeah. So the other ones are pretty boring after that. So I did, that one was in Seattle. I presented it at uh, Disney HQ, because uh, the folks at Disney, um, that was the building where they designed the uh, NFC wristbands for our Disneyland, so now you just walk around like tap into things to buy things and you know, so you have to carry money around the Disneylands. Um, so Disney run their own Android meetup in Seattle, um, so they were very kind to let us use the space for that. Um, that was in Singapore. Singapore was fantastic. Um, they weren't kidding when I was like, I was like, I think, is it gonna rain? Nah, it's not gonna rain, there's no way to rain. And it's like, as I say, like the clouds just come out and just starts raining straight away. I'm like, wow, that just jinxed it. Um, it was great, but no, Singapore was fantastic. And the iOS community in Singapore is amazing. Um, that was at Sydney. Um, the very awesome folks at Combank um, let us use their event space. Um, so it's like, oh, that's a whole part of Combank engineers there. Um, I'll, I'll tell you about them when the recording's off about their opinions on Combank and Apple Pay. Um, the Perth one, uh, I'll talk about that later. Um, the Perth one, I was pushing for the most hardest, but basically it was a lot of like trying to find a nice venue in, on budget and things like that. And it just, didn't, it fizzled out to the point that just before, I was just about to commit to it, but then I got the word that the, the, the um, restructuring is about to happen. But I'll talk about that in more detail. And then that was Melbourne. Um, more people came after that photo, I, I swear. But Melbourne was fantastic. We did it at a consultancy in Melbourne who run, run the, um, the Melbourne Cocoa Heads meetup as well. So they were, they were really fantastic. And that one was Vancouver in Canada where like we brought the pizza out, a bunch of people not involved with the meetup just swarmed in, ate all the pizza and left, and then the actual people arrived and went, where's the pizza? And we're like, what, wait, what? Who were those people just then? And yeah, that was a bit sad. <laughs> this is hungry, hungry Vancouver startup people. And this year was really cool as well. Um, for the first time in like, what was that? I got 2012. First time in five years, I've actually got a WWDC ticket. So we went down, like a lot of realm people went down to that. Um, and Realm was doing a, a kind of like an interview setup next to the, that, like that's the building right next to where the, um, the convention center was. And so during the week, they'd invite developers along to, um, uh, to be interviewed. 
So uh, I interviewed a few. That's Greg Hero from in Instagram, and that's um, Andy Hope, who's a Perth, a Perth chap who moved to Melbourne, and now he's working for Facebook. And then there's us Realm people being really busy looking. Um, but we basically did a whole bunch of interviews during that week and interviewed a lot of sweet, really, really awesome people. Um, I also interviewed the, the, folk, the, the chap who made Halide, the camera app, who was really, really like, passionate about metal um, and just talking about how great metal is for like, um, what it enables on, on mobile devices. And then just throughout the week, there was like, um, all sorts of sweet events. Like I got, I got to meet James Dempsey at his um, James Dempsey in the Break, Breakpoints concert. And then at WWDC, Michelle Obama came and did an interview. And then uh, John Gruber did his Daring Fireball thingy. And uh, there's two Apple guys. So I have no idea who they are. Came and, came and talked, talked about it. Actually, no, that's great. Um, it's Craig and um, Phil. Um, so Craig, Craig was great because Craig, um, Craig likes to troll Phil. So he was like, apparently he got like one of those really sweet promotion iPads before um, anyone else at Apple knew they existed. So like he was just like using it at an um, Apple meeting, like going, yeah, yeah, whatever, scroll, 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 scroll. And Phil's like, that, that scrolling doesn't look right. What? What, what is that? Kind of like, it's just, a, just a screw with Phil. Apparently it worked really well. Um, but that video is live on um, Gruber's website if you want to uh, watch it. Um, but yeah, that's basically it. Hopefully it wasn't too chaotic what I just said, but let me just, um, just come, hopefully come, let you come away with a few good things. Um, People have said this to me before I even considered it, but working at, at a company in San Francisco, even if it's remote, even if you do go over there for a bit, like I did, um, it's awesome. Like that is the best place to learn new things. Like the amount of stuff you can learn and how quickly you can learn it is um, unparalleled. Um, if you're actually living there, um, just well, even, even for living here, like just learning the process was one thing, but actually going over there for a bit, um, there's like 10 meetups every night from like San Francisco all the way down to like San Jose. Like Google run like weekly iOS meetups at the Google campus. Like you can, you can go to a meetup every single day and learn something new about iOS or web design or C++ or um, Bitcoin if you want. It's just, there's so much you can do there. So it's, uh, like I just recommend it if you can get the chance and the time. Um, go spend a little time there. Um, whoops, what? Oh, whoops. How did I do that? Um, I hit, I randomly poked my phone and somehow I got, uh, I managed to hit uh, end this presentation. Um, Next, um, like I, I, it can't be stressed enough. Like my, the last four, three, four jobs, three or four jobs I've got were from that comic book app I made. Like that was the thing I, I put in my portfolio, and that, that's what got me the job. So I really can't stress enough that having a side project is totally worth it. Even if you can make money out of it, that's even better. But just having one that can show off your skills and um, you can use as a piece just to demonstrate what you're capable of, um, it works really, really well. So. How many jobs did I uh, nearly got one job at a jail. No. <laughs> no, no, no. Actually, maybe one, maybe nearly one, just showing the code. Yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't get any app So yeah, make sure you, you've got like legal clearance for, on a completely unrelated note. You know, make sure whatever you do is not going to end in a lawsuit because you can't get hired for lawsuit stuff. That's a separate story. Um, um, and basically like what I'm doing right now, like presented all the things. Conferences put out pa call for papers around the world all the time. Sometimes they can give you a bit of a budget to fly over. So like, it doesn't matter if it's a, an Australian conference, like ones in, um, ones in Melbourne like DevWorld and maybe Playgrounds are, are one thing, but like there's so many around the world. Um, and in 2015, like Realm was like, the Realm people like actively saying like, you, you're doing this conference, you're doing this conference. That's how, why I ended up in Italy doing, talking about um, iOS at an Italian uh, iOS conference. Um, yeah, it's just basically get, get out there. It doesn't matter what you talk about. Uh, ne never, never think to yourself that you're not going to be as good as, these, as, as the other people. Um, everyone knows something different, and everyone can bring something unique to the table. So never be afraid of going like, "Oh, I better not present at that." Uh, everyone else is going to be way better than me. Um, just go for, go for broke and hope for the best because it's really good. But the most important thing after that is always make sure you record it, like I'm doing right now, um, and put that up online afterwards because you still get a lot more engagement online as well. People will be searching for iOS. Uh, presentations and things like that. So as long as you make something that, that people want to watch, um, yeah, like people will come and they'll, they'll be, then you know, you might get a job out of it. You never know. There's an iOS meetup in Perth um, that you might want to consider presenting at. Yeah, there's, I, which, which was that, Freytel? Um, yeah, no, seriously, I, as I can say, like this, is, this meetup might actually be the best thing that happened to me because I got a job at Silicon Valley out of it. So um, no, no hyperbole whatsoever. Um, and yeah, I guess, you know, given the recent uh, climate, I hate to say you have to be nice, but 
Um, yeah, Twitter is a very, very important thing. Like people, uh, not even like what I did, but like even to a lesser extent, other people have like made random tweets and gotten jobs out of it before. So the fact that Twitter is this giant public pool, um, if you play your cards right, you can get so many opportunities on Twitter alone as well. So it's really, really important to be on Twitter, be nice, um, but yeah, but keep an ear out as well. Like I know a lot of companies advertise on Twitter for, first and foremost, and then afterwards. I think you can get Elon Musk's phone number. You can also get, <laughs> you can also get Elon Musk's phone number on Twitter, um, which apparently points to an Easter egg if you call it or something. Um, yeah, and in fact, I remember at one point, um, what was it, uh, LeVar Burton like, tweeted at Will Wheaton, like, here's my phone number, and like, like oh, I have to get a, phone, a new phone number now. So then, like, so then Will Wheaton was like, all right, internet, LeVar's gonna tell me his new phone number, keep your ears shut for the next five minutes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, in any case, thank you so much for watching, I hope you learned something new, um, and thank you so much for coming, I hope you had a good 2017, Merry Christmas, and hopefully I'll see you all again next year. That's it.